the Torah that I teach this week as we return to our very beginning with Parshat Breshit is in honor and memory of my grandfather in the week of his first yard site. Uh, my grandfather, Paul Beagle, was a Holocaust survivor and a man who overflowed with laughter and love. And I pray that his resilience and memory will be a blessing and inspiration. I teach this in his honor. So each Shabbat, when we recite Kiddush, we recall the story of creation, which we read from the Torah this week. In six days, God created the heavens and the earth. You know how this story goes. And it culminates in the creation of humanity. And on the seventh day, God rested, the first Shabbat in history. Now, but if we follow the timeline of events as later rabbinic tradition would have them, which blurs the two creation stories in Genesis 1 and 2, on the eve of the sixth day, God created humankind, settling them in the Garden of Eden, a paradise free from struggle and want, filled with bounty and beauty, humanity's first home. And that still new sun set and the still new moon rose and God rested and the first man and the first woman slept their first sleep in paradise. And then, on the morning of that seventh day, the first Shabbat, the humans began to explore their new home, watered by winding rivers, bustling with creatures big and small, shaded by fragrant, fruitful trees of every kind. But one winding creature convinced one curious woman to eat from just that one tree in the middle of the garden, and that evening, as the still new sun sat and the still new moon rose on the world's eighth day, God banished humankind from Eden, our first home, but ours for only the first day of history. Now, citing this interpretation, my friend and teacher, Rabbi Tali Adler, offers a beautiful rereading of the first question asked by the paradigmatic medieval Torah commentator, Rashi. Rashi opens his commentary on the Torah by asking, essentially, if the first mitzvah in the Torah doesn't occur until Exodus 12, why does the Torah begin with an account of creation? On the surface, Rashi is asking about the purpose of story in a book of law, but Rabbi Adler reinterprets his question as why does the Torah begin with the story of a lost Eden? Why remind us that we will never truly, at the deepest human level, be at home? Why begin with the story of a lost Eden? It's sad, really, how quickly loss became etched into the, the heart of the human condition, a grief that is exacerbated by having known wholeness in the first place. We might read this as unfair, as unkind, a cruel irony baked in from the beginning, but we might also read this story with a nechemta, with a note of comfort, that even from the very beginning, the human story is one of change. Change, as we all know, can be positive or negative and very often both inextricably twined together. But all change involves some kind of loss of what was and what can never be. And when we experience those more difficult sides of change, disruption, dislocation, disorientation, the fears and unknowns of starting over, of moving forward, we relive a little loss of Eden and its attendant grief. But that little part of the heart that carries our most ancient human memories feels that pain and recognizes it as something we've been through before and therefore something we can survive again because we have inherited something else from our original ancestors, a gift from the divine in the form of how our story tells us that human beings were created. Now, as traumatic as the expulsion from Eden was, if we scroll back a little bit in the story, we find that it wasn't the first major change that humanity experienced. In Genesis 2, we learn that the first human being, the Adam, began its life in one form, but when a fitting partner couldn't be found for it, God cast a deep sleep on the Adam and took one of its sides, not ribs, sides, to rebuild into the second human, a splitting of the atom, if you will. <laughs> Thank you. 
In these early hours of human existence, these first human bodies from which all of ours derive experienced a radical rupture. One of them missing a part that would never return, and the other pushed and pulled and rebuilt into something completely different. This loss and change was then passed down in the creation of all of their future descendants in the shapes in which we continue to inhabit our bodies, which hold the memories of responding to the necessity and the inevitability of change. But what's even more remarkable than the fact that change is inherent to the creation of humankind is that the very stuff from which we're formed is capable of such flexibility, such resilience, that it can be taken apart and turned into something new and not only survive, but thrive and perhaps even become something better. We read in Genesis 2 that the Adam was shaped from the Adama, the dust of the earth, the verb used here, yatsar, means formed or shaped. And it's the same verb that's used to describe the actions of a potter working with clay. It's an intimate and powerful metaphor for God as the creator. We think of the hands of a potter caked with clay dust, doing the slow, messy, hard work of squeezing, shaping, smoothing, coaxing a humble substance into something as miraculous as a human body. And the fact that clay serves as the metaphor for the matter of the human form is no less remarkable. Clay is malleable. It's a substance that responds to the pressure of being worked, not by bending or res by breaking or resisting or melting away, but by bending, reforming, and holding the new shape that it's given. Perhaps the secret to clay's resiliency is in its metaphorical makeup. Clay is essentially earth plus water. Earth gives us groundedness, stability, a sense of always being connected to the ground beneath our feet. But water, on the other hand, is always in motion. It's constantly flowing and even changing forms as it evaporates and condenses and freezes and thaws. So mixed together, earth and water create a substance that's capable of being both stable and also able to change its shape when pressed. Clay is resilient, and if change is part of the human story from the very beginning of creation, the stuff from which we're made is perfectly suited to meet the conditions we're made to face. Because we, clay creatures kissed to life by God, carry within our chromosomes the contradictory qualities of both earth and water. Wherever we stand, we can connect to the steady ground beneath our feet. And whatever comes our way, we can have the flexibility to bend without breaking. My favorite understanding of resilience comes from a little book called Welcome to the Grief Club, which helped me to process my own grief over the losses of three loved ones this past year. Now, resilience, the author Janine Kuo writes, isn't staying steadfast on a path that no longer exists. But resilience is doing the messy, hard, and slow work of creating a new life when returning to the old one is no longer an option. It's a lesson that Adam and Eve learned so long ago. Change is inevitable and inevitably comes with loss. But even after only their first day of existence, when humankind was exiled from the Garden of Eden, even then their bodies knew, we've been through this before. We've lived through loss and change. And while we can't go back to the way things were before we survived, we adapted, we reshaped ourselves and began again. Change is the heart of our human story, and that is why the Torah begins with an account of creation. Because it teaches us that we were made from the steady earth and the flowing rivers of Eden, that we are made to be resilient, so that when, not if, loss or change come our way, we are capable of bending so that we do not break. Yes.
we were exiled from Eden. And so we all carry a little bit of us wherever we go. But we were also created from Eden's clay. And when we access our innate resilience by holding on to what grounds us and moving with flexibility and openness towards the future, whatever it may bring, we tap into the little bit of paradise that we carry with us as well. May we each be blessed with the comfort that when we are in the midst of change, that is when we're truly at home. Shabbat Shalom. song can you hear our song may we find our way back home can you hear our song can you hear our song